I'm Beth, and today I'm joined by Dr. Holly Walker, who is with Smithsonian Gardens. And we also have Ahmad Atala, who works for Hexel, which makes all sorts of honeycomb products. Ahmad is actually on travel, and we are so glad that he was able to join us remotely. If you have any questions for Holly or Ahmad, please type them in the comments section below, and we'll get to as many as possible. Holly, Ahmad, welcome. Are you guys ready to get started? Yes. Thank you, yes. Holly, let's start with you. Uh, first, uh, start by telling us what is a honeybee hive and what's going on in there? So a honeybee hive is the home that the honeybees have created for themselves. And you know, when we traditionally think of hives nowadays, we think of these created structures that are man-made structures, but the hive doesn't necessarily have to be that. A lot of times hives originally were in like tree hollows or you know located in different places in nature but now we've really kind of developed them to really settle into these box-like structures or what they used to have these skein like structures as well um, but what's neat about this is that the hive really is the community it's the place where they you know produce food it's where they're um, changing that nectar to honey or making the bee bread that they need to it's where they raise their offspring it's really the central activity for this entire colony and it's where the queen is a great at work and with her sisters they're all kind of producing you know not just honey but the um the beeswax and everything along those lines so it really is the center of their lives and it has a very specific shape which is a honeycomb structure uh, can you tell us what is interesting about this structure? So the great thing about the honeycomb structure is this fact that bees have really figured out how to use producing that they're secreting from glands underneath themselves and they're uh, chewing this wax into a shape and then they're able to mold it. Now the thing is they need to have a shape that's both lightweight but really strong and uses the least amount of material because again this is something that they're producing and they can only produce so much of it and it takes a lot of individuals. So this wonderful honeycomb shape is really that kind of perfect fusion of you know it's durable, it uses We have a Facebook question. Um, Chelsea would like to know, what is a honeybee hive made of? So for the most part, the hive itself is actually made of the beeswax. So that's what those individual combs are made out of. Um, but the other part of this is bees kind of create their own glue, which is called, um, I always mispronounce it. It's like glycopolis. It's a type of glue that they actually make, again, through chewing up, you know, different materials and it hardens and it's amazingly tough. Uh, any beekeeper will tell you if you've tried to take frames apart and they were too close to each other, they will solidify and harden so much that you almost can't, um, get it off. You actually literally have to take like a crowbar and pry it off or that kind of thing. I actually have this, uh, queen, uh, it's like a queen divider so that when you're replacing queen, and if you look here on the side of it, that dark residue, that's actually, I don't know, if, yeah, if you can see it there, um, that dark residue is that, um, that a while this stuff just doesn't really degrade. So it's actually a really strong material. And so they're putting all these different things into the hive to make it very sound, very structured, but also to kind of keep it warm and keep it away from predators. Ahmad, we've talked a little bit about what a uh, hive is, but why is this honeycomb shape so important and of interest to human engineers? Yeah, I, Holly had the answer. I, when you think about a structure that you're trying to use, especially for airplanes, um, if you take a step back, what you're trying to do is you're anything that you're putting on the airplane, you're trying to lift off the ground and anything that you're lifting off the ground requires power, spending fuel, and that's expensive. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to create a structure where you're using the least amount of material, which is weight, and produce the, uh, the mechanical properties to, to be a structural component. And, you know, the bees have it right. They, it, it's a really good shape in that manner, in that use. And that's why the aerospace industry has, has been using it for the last 70 years. I wanted to show, this is one of the, the uh, samples that you sent us. Holly, you can see how tiny this is. But, uh, so this is how you ship some of your honeycomb. If you want to take that one end, Holly, and yep. we'll pull. curtains of this design, because, now this is just a tiny bit, but we have some over here. 
that we have pulled out. Tell us about this. This is really kind of neat. Yeah, I, you know, the process of making honeycomb um, is really interesting. So what you have in your hand here is essentially sheets of uh, aluminum uh, that were much longer where we printed an adhesive line at those distances that you see between each of those cells and we stacked them on top of each other. And then when we stack them, we then we cut them into those thin slices that you're holding in your hand. And that's how the process is made is in the aluminum type, we cut them before expansion and then we expand them to the shape that they really need to be used for. So this is much easier to move around. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, there, there, there is honeycomb that we make that's not made out of aluminum. It's made out of paper or fiberglass or carbon fiber. It is easier to expand when it's in the block form, uh, but aluminum is a lot heavier. So we do cut it just in that type of shape piece that you had before expansion. And then we expand it to be used in either a panel between skins or in other type of applications. We have some more questions coming in. Uh... Mostly, mostly for you right now, Lisa. Um, if a bee is chasing you, what should you do? Uh, it goes against your instinct to run away from a bee, but you shouldn't actually run away from a bee unless the bee is really aggressive. But one of the things that people generally tend to do when a bee is chasing them is to flail their arms, to swat at the bee. And what the bee sees this is, is an aggressive attack on it, and it's going to be more aggressive with you. Um, as somebody who's spent a lot of times around bees, especially in fields, especially right next to their hives when they're out swarming and they're collecting, I used to actually chase bees with a flower to make them try and <laughs> pollinate a single flower and get in their faces. They didn't want to sting me. They really don't want to sting you. They only go after you if they feel like you're being threatening to them. And so one of the easiest things you can do is stop. I usually tell people to stop, breathe, Watch what the bee's doing. They want to investigate you for a second. They want to look at you, see what you're doing, and then if you pose them no more threat, they're more than happy to move on the way. Now that said, they do like some colors in your shirt, so if you have a really floral or bright color or you're wearing a really floral scent, they might come investigate you a little more because they probably think you're a flower. Ahmad, uh, Christine would like to know, uh, and I mainly I think for the aerospace industry, why is the sheer strength of the honeycomb so important? Um, well, uh, shear, just to explain to, to, the, to the viewers, uh, compression and shear are kind of opposite forces. And uh, when you're making a panel, you're mainly using it in the compression force. So you're, imagine uh, the floor panel when you walk on an airplane, uh, all the floor panels are made out of honeycomb. So you're only stepping on them. But there's also honeycomb in the sidewalls, in the bins. Um, in the lavatories and the galleys and some of those applications you have a panel of honeycomb where you have another piece that's held on it that's perpendicular so a shear force is applied in the opposite in the perpendicular direction to compression so the the panel does need to withstand a certain amount of shear force i just want to uh remind everybody that we are taking questions and please put them in the comment section that we'll get to as many as we can you were talking about ahmad the different ways you all use honeycomb in um airlines and i wanted to show the visitors this or our viewers this this is kind of an interesting it's not the shape that we were looking at before it's a different shape but um what this allows you to do In the aerospace industry, why is that bend important? Oh, this is just a great example, Beth. This, this is a product that we call uh, FlexCore. And, you know, you, you hear a lot the word core used as essentially the same as honeycomb. And it's just a shorter word that we use. And core is really to, to show that this product is used in the core of a lot of things on an airplane. So the shape that we came up with is... If you look at all the the different uh, bended, like it looks like essentially a sombrero hat. Uh, if you look at the the fact that the free the free cell wall is really that is the part that allows the part to bend. Um, I'll tell you, there's there's one application that we did not talk a whole lot about, but the uh, the nacelle of a jet engine uh, the, uh, is made out of honeycomb as well. And when you look at the radius that sometimes you need to have the material bend around that nacelle, you have, it's not always a, a perfect circle. 
There are some areas where you have certain parts around the engine that you know, add an, another curvature. So you need a product that's able to not only bend in a straight diameter, but have the ability to go around a shaped part to, to provide that cover and that protection uh, in an SL and uh, for an engine. Holly, so that's really Lisa, important. Holly, Lisa would like to know, do the black stripes on bees mean anything? It's not so much specifically the black stripes, but with a lot of insects, um, it's the coloration, it's the patterns. So this is usually a warning indicator to other species, to potentially predators, to know that, hey, I may hurt you, I may be poisonous. You know, in the cases of, of most bees, but actually not all bees have stingers, but it is kind of a warning that says, look, I'm not going to be an easy meal for you if you come after me. So having those different color patterns, and it's not always black and yellow, but there can also be reds, anything that's gonna give that kind of visual cue to predators to say, hey, Back up a little bit, please. I have a really stupid cat that catches a bee every year. <laughs> he has not learned that yet. <laughs> LJ would like to know how honey is made. So um, honey is made actually from bees going out and they're collecting nectar. And so they're bringing back, and that nectar is really kind of this very liquidy, it's very fluid-like. And so when they bring this back to the hive, what they're doing is they're placing it into cells and they need to actually dehydrate it a little bit. So that kind of like takes out that water moisture and they're concentrating down these sugars and these carbohydrates that they're gonna use later. And so it's neat because what you'll see sometimes in hives is there are bees that actually sit there and fan their wings to kind of help dehydrate uh, the nectar over time so that it can become this honey substance, which is so full of energy for them. And that's what they really need is that energy with a, a lot less moisture. Erin bought a pollinator house, but she wants to know how to encourage bees to come and not wasps. It depends on the type of wasp. Um, so uh, I don't know if you guys can see, but I have some different types of bee houses that we have here. And one of the prime examples that I have is this one. This one was actually given to me by one of my coworkers here at Smithsonian Gardens. And they kind of had the same question because there's this wonderful little slit that's right in the middle. And um, as Marty and I were walking up here, I said, oh, you should take a look in there and see what's in there. Because if you look close by, you're gonna see that there's actually a paper wasp nest perfectly formed inside that little slit. Everybody thinks butterflies. They're not going in there. <laughs> it's a paper wasp. But paper wasps actually aren't a bad thing. Um, wasps are predators and they're beneficial predators. So I wouldn't necessarily say that you wanna completely discourage them. Most wasps really aren't that aggressive. Um, they really just kind of want to go out, hunt for food and bring it back. Some wasps do predate on bees, but that's actually a natural part of the life cycle and bees produce so many offspring that that's okay. So if you're not concerned about the stings and you can kind of let them be, um, the wasps aren't really doing a lot of harm and they're just a part of that life cycle. I want to uh, kick it back to Ahmad. I want to show another piece of the, the honeycomb that Hexel sent us. Uh, this has got fabric in the in the cells. Why do you put fabric inside the cell? Um, this is this is a great example of how multifunctional um, these honeycomb structures could be. So so that piece of fabric that you see in there is actually an acoustic dampener uh, into the nacelle of an engine. So the the new airplanes that are being designed, are being built today, have to operate around airports where there's a lot of residential areas and noise that they make is something that is really problematic. So what we have developed, we've developed a solution where we put that type of mesh inside the honeycomb and that goes in that structure around the engine and it eliminates a significant part of the noise that the engine generates that allows those airplanes to be less of an annoyance on the on the homes that are around airports and be able to give the airlines more time of operation in a day. So they can take off and land earlier in the morning when you know, some people are still sleeping or be able to land late at night. Those times of operations expand when we have that type of functionality um, used inside the honeycomb. So not only that they're good and structural, but they give you that advantage of adding functionality inside of it. It's, it's pretty amazing. Okay, um, Holly, Landon would like to know, when you go to collect the honey, what do you do uh, so that the bees won't sting you? Um, if you're ever worried about going to do bee collecting or um, wanna go work with bees, a really easy solution to that is to have a bee suit. And there are many different types of bee suits. I actually have one over here on the side. 
Um, and there's really different varieties of these. So you can have all kinds of different hoods. But the main thing is, I think for most people, is they want to protect their face. It's important because, you know, bees, again, they don't really want to sting you. But if they get tangled in your hair or around your face, you might flinch, you might move. Um, definitely if they get tangled in your hair, they're going to become agitated. So they'll do something. So you definitely want to protect your face. So this one, I don't know if you guys can see, has this nice screen that kind of pops out here. The other thing that's really good to do is to wear like a thick fabric that's still breathable because a lot of times when you're working with bees, it's hot outside. But it's a nice protective fabric. It usually has either a dual layer or it's thick enough that if they were to get their stinger, they can't fully get their stinger through. It's not going to get to you. And you just want to cover your body as much as possible. Um, I have a friend who, you know, uh, when they go out, they wear the full gloves, but then they'll also tape around the edges. So anywhere where there might be a gap. So like at the edges of your feet, like by your socks, your shoes, around your wrists, because bees are very good at finding new crevices. And if they can find a hole, they're going to get in. So don't give them the opportunity because getting trapped right next to you is probably not their favorite place to be. Ahmad, um, Faith would like to know who came up with the idea for using honeycomb in the aerospace industry? Uh, oh gosh, I, I don't know. I would have to, I would have to research that, but I, I want to say it's probably around 70 or 80 years ago. And I, I don't know how it happened or how was it, it was invented. I know that Hexel actually was around the time where the company, you know, when the company started and that's one of our first, not the first product, but one of our first products that we've, we've started using. Now, as far as how far back in time, I'd, I'd have to actually research that. I don't know. Faith, good job. You stumped one of our experts. <laughs> <laughs> it, gives, it gives me homework. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try and get an answer for you and put it on Facebook. Uh, Holly, Nora would like to know, why do bees die after they sting? Ah, uh, right. So, the stinger is actually a modified ovipositor, which is a part of an insect that would be used to lay eggs, but bees don't necessarily need to use this anymore, but it is attached to their bodies. Now the stinger has been developed to have barbs inside of it so that when it stings, um, the barbs actually expand and so they don't want to come back out. So now that's putting tension on the bee's body. Because it is attached to them and it doesn't necessarily break off, it's actually going to I sadly enough ripped the end of the bee off and it actually kills them in the process of that removal. And Jocelyn would like to know when you buy beeswax products, um, is it dangerous or unsafe taking that wax out of the hive? Uh, no. So actually the neat thing is when you are, um, when you're, um, harvesting the honey itself, the bees are getting moved into a different part of that beehive. Now that, again, we've created these kind of box structures, so we're able to move the bees out. And so when we take the individual frames that um, have the honey, but therefore also the combs themselves, they're actually completely scraped off with no bees in place and we can remove all that product safely. And then actually the bees get a brand new frame to work off of. And so they continue to build more. So it's actually really nice. It kind of keeps things clean and moving for them. Ahmad, uh what you've been talking about being an engineer and building honeycomb what other types of jobs are there at hexel um oh great question i we so we make we manufacture composite materials and one of them is honeycomb so we we have um, people that do engineering work obviously design manufacturing work um marketing work uh finance um you know, uh, human resources type of work. So in order to have a good functioning group, you need a lot of those types of functions working together. But but we are a technology company, so we, we were mostly focused on uh, scientists, engineers, you know, from a chemical background, uh, from a mechanical engineering background, which is my, you know, my, uh, my schooling. But, uh, but there's, there's a lot of different disciplines. Holly, um, we're getting a lot of questions about bees in space. Uh, do you know anything about it other than we sent up some? I don't. And the interesting thing to me is I actually, when we had our program beforehand, I kind of thought about that. And I was kind of curious how I thought maybe bees would function in an environment like that. But I think the hardest part about it is, is that bees use uh, solar rays, radiation, and all those things to direct themselves. So I can't imagine that bees would do very well in space because they would really kind of lack those cues that they need to be able to navigate and orient themselves. So while I don't know personally, 
I think that that's something to kind of explore if people want to continue to explore it, or it's just a very interesting topic to think about how bees function in the world around us and what cues actually help them to do the job they do and how maybe space wouldn't have that for them. Or maybe it would. <laughs> well, now you all have stumped Holly a little bit. <laughs> uh, we will, again, do some research and, and look that up. I have a question from Clint, and this could be for both of you. Um, has We've been talking about honeycomb and aerospace industry, but we also know it's used in architecture. Um, has the honeycomb shape been used? Was it used in ancient architecture? And how far back? Egypt? Does anybody know? In terms of architecture, I'm trying to think if we've really used it that far back because a lot of the stuff that we used bees for, especially, again, a lot of our initial uh, history of ancient bees shows up in these paintings from ancient Egypt. But again, it's mostly just how to harvest and farm and raise those types of things. Um, I think that the actual architecture itself came later, really kind of understand, understanding how those shapes kind of fit together and how they provide structural support. Okay. Ahmad, do you have yeah, any ideas? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I don't know how far back it, it, it's been used. I know it, it is used in buildings, in construction, and sometimes in, in some structures on the ground. And, and I think it, it, it goes back, it's, it's not the best product to use. It tends to be a little bit more expensive because you're, you're not really, you don't really need to have that lightweight. But in tall buildings, I know in some of the structures it's used. Um, it would be interesting. I, I don't know how far back. I, I think that, uh, you know, from a na nature perspective, we, we, there must have been that type of observation that um, humans have made. So uh, another homework, I'm, I've got two written <laughs> down. <laughs> well, go I guess Marty and, and I will, Marty and I will be busy trying to answer some of these questions. You guys are asking really good questions. Um, Austin would like to know what plants can you plant in a garden to help uh, bees pollinate, to help pollinators? Excellent. That is a really good question. So as I said before, I work for the gardens here, Smithsonian Gardens, and we, we ask those same questions of ourselves. And there's a lot of debate on what plants are the best for bees. Um, a lot of people will tell you, especially for our native bees, so these are mostly our solitary bees, our bumblebees, carpenter bees, things like that. Um, try to plant a few natives if you can. Those are really great because they have evolved alongside of the bees that we have here. So they're very well designed to pollinate those types of plants. Um, but there are other plants that aren't necessarily native that do produce a lot of um, nectar. They can produce a lot of pollen, which is also very important. And there's actually a lot of really cool research going on right now that's kind of looking at that and trying to see which plants really are the most beneficial. But I think things that you can look at is by looking around you and seeing what types of plants you see a lot of bees attracted to. Um, but I would definitely say if you have an option, try to plant native because it really is a resource that you know that they have evolved with and it's going to provide the right resources for them. Now you talked about, you mentioned solitary bees, and um, we, at, this afternoon uh, at 2 o'clock, will put out a video on building solitary bee houses. But do you want to tell us what this is and, and give yeah. us a little background on the, the mason bee? Yes, definitely. So again, when we're talking about our different types of bees, we usually are talking about two really two specific groups. We have social bees, like our honey bees, which live in these hives. But then we have our solitary bees, and they actually make up most of the bees out there. They're about 90% of the bee species that we have. And they're not like the honey bee in the sense that every female is her own queen, and she doesn't produce a hive. So depending on the type of bee will depend on what area that they're going to need to put food into and produce and lay their eggs for the next generation. And you guys have probably seen a lot of these types of houses, or particularly these types of houses, which are very easy for you to make. And these are for mason bees. Mason bees are really cool, small native that we have around here. And what they do is they use tubes. Usually they would use hollow stems, um, but we also provide for them as well. We can use straws, we can use these cardboard tubes. Um, some people say that you should or shouldn't use bamboo. Bamboo can sometimes be difficult, um, but there's all these different really neat materials that you can use for them. And what's neat about the way that the mason bees work is that so that female, she's going out, she's collecting food, she's getting pollen, she needs to make it into a food source that her babies are gonna be able to use, but she won't be there for them. So she creates a tiny little cell and she'll go out and actually harvest mud, or if it's a leaf cutter bee, she would actually harvest pieces of a leaf that she cut specifically and she'll lay an egg she'll leave the food and then she'll seal that chamber and she'll continue to do that all the way through the tube 
And so by creating these houses, it's a really good way to create space for them. And even though she only, she doesn't have a hive of her own, she will share this space with a bunch of her neighbors and other native bees as well. So it kind of makes this really cool apartment complex kind of community <laughs> that they live in. One of the things that I did learn uh, when researching this show is that honeybees uh, do not hibernate in the winter. They actually are, keep themselves warm. Janelle wants to know what do bees in general do over the winter? What do the mason bees do? So yeah, for our honeybees, as you said, they don't actually um, hibernate. What they're doing is they're all huddled together, keeping each other warm, and they really are able at generating a lot of heat to keep themselves active. But again, our mason bees don't do that. They don't have that hive to depend on. So sadly enough, the female who has laid her eggs, she will pass on before we get to winter. Now what's happening from there is during the summer season, her offspring are um, eating, they're producing, and now they're gonna pupate. So they're gonna go into a cocoon-like structure and that's how they're gonna overwinter. They're gonna wait until the spring arrives again, it gets warm enough for them, and they know that the flowers will be there for them. So they're gonna hang out over winter by sleeping in their cocoons. Ahmad, what do you think is one of the most important uses of honey, of the honeycomb pattern in the aerospace industry? Um, it, it's really uh, kind of, as I mentioned earlier, it, it's, in, it's in the application where you do need that structure and when you need that weight. So anything that needs to be light and needs to be lifted off the ground where energy needs to be consumed to do that. Uh, is a perfect use of honeycomb. We are actually running out of time and we've got all these questions. Uh, uh, We've got time for a couple more questions. Marty's telling me we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, What are the conservation efforts? uh, Are there any conservation efforts um, being made for bees? Definitely. There's definitely conservation efforts being made for bees. There's a lot of things that you can do as a homeowner, as a student, um, to help out bees, but there's really great societies. Uh, There's particularly uh, the Million Pollinator um, projects that are going on. There are, um, I'm trying to think, the Xerxes Society is a really great group that works specifically on native bees and really wants to promote native bee health. But again, I think if you get at the community level, you'll find that there are a lot of organizations locally, either through park services, through beekeeping organizations, who really care about what's happening. Even farmers and agriculture and horticulture all want these pollinators to be around because they provide so much service for us. So if you look in your local area and just look up bee conservation, you'll see. But the biggest thing is creating spaces for them, even in urban environments. Bees actually are really good sometimes in urban environments. So there's things that you can do even around your home. Even if you live in an apartment like I do, I plant my balcony with all kinds of plants, some native, some just flowering, but I get bees even in my tiny little apartment sometimes. And I think that that's really a great thing. Um, So just making space for them, planting flowers. Uh, You can put out a bowl of water with little marbles or beads or something in it, or even small stones. Bees need water as well. So anything that you can think of to create habitat for them is the best thing you can do for them. And we have, uh, we produced a video on how to be helpful and we will post that uh, on Facebook. Um, Amada, I did just get uh, some of your homework. The first patent for the honeycomb structure was in 1915. All right. All right. Good to know. When... Okay. Uh, Chelsea wants to know if there are any poisonous bees. Poisonous bees? No, not in that sense. So when you get stung, they do have a venom sac. So you are reacting to a venom that is being pushed into underneath your skin. And so that's the thing. When you get stung, a lot of people say um, not to rub it. What you actually need to do is either take the edge of your fingernail or the edge of a card or something and gently scrape it away because you don't want to accidentally uh, continue to push that venom sac because that'll, of course, cause you to have more of a reaction. But in terms of being poisonous, not so much. Again, some people have to be careful because they can have an allergic reaction to it. So if you ever get stung and start to feel a little bit swollen, a little bit dizzy, please make sure you go seek medical help. It's very important, you know, that you stay safe when you're around bees. Here's one I think might sc- stump you, skunk you, stump you. Uh, Katie wants to know what was the largest bee ever found? I forget what the common name of it is, but there is a really fantastic large bee. So there's these two different bees. There's one that literally can fit 
uh, right next to the head on a dime. And then the other one, I believe, is a type of carpenter bee. And, and I don't remember the name off the top of my head, but it's a fantastic bee. It's like this big. And I don't think you'd be very thrilled if you saw a bee that big. But then again, most of these bees are docile. Now, I will say this with carpenter bees, particularly male carpenter bees, they want to be more intimidating than they are because they have no stinger. And that's the secret. The male bees have no stingers, so they have to make you be afraid of them. Um, so they'll get in your face. So if you ever get a carpenter bee up in your face and you notice the little yellow patch on the front of his face that tells you that he's a boy, especially with the ones that we have around here. I don't know if that's true for all carpenter bees, but at least here, if you see a yellow patch on his face and he gets right up here, he's a boy and he's just trying to intimidate you, but he can't do anything about it. I just got word that it's Wallace's giant bee. There you go. Uh, Ahmad, the samples that you sent us, the honeycomb are, is different sizes. Can you tell us a little bit about why you would want larger honeycomb and smaller honeycomb in, in, the, in, the, in the industry? Yes, the, uh, really when you think about those types of uh, small size honeycombs, it's about density. So applications where you need um, the panel to be stronger so you have those cells to be a lot smaller. You have more material there. Uh, if it doesn't need to be as strong, you can have those cells to be a little bit larger. So it's really around what you need to design into your system. It needs more mechanical properties or less. Exactly. So the, the piece that you have in, in your left hand is a piece that probably is going to be in, a, in an application where uh, you need the material to be a lot stronger versus the one that you have in your right hand. And when you go onto an airplane, you don't see the, the honeycomb pattern. W why? <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, it's what you see is the thin skin material. So there's uh, there's there's skin that's on obviously on the floor and on the side walls or in the bins, and it's really. A, a, it's part of the structure as well. The skin does add to the shear of the properties, but it's really to protect it from the elements. It, you know, the, no dust, no water runs through it, and it doesn't, you know, you don't want that to be in those types of structures. Some of them, you don't want moisture because it does degrade some of the, uh, you know, some of their properties. So you're absolutely right. It's, it's in a cocoon of honeycomb, but you don't see any of it because it's protected uh, by by that skin and the skin is made out of, it's also a composite material it's it could be a uh, glass uh, fiber or it could be carbon fiber skin and it's usually you know two three millimeters thick very thin we have a couple more questions kim would like to know what is royal jelly made of so try and make sure that i get this right um royal jelly is a little bit different in the sense that unlike the other um nectar that they're, the, the materials that they're feeding those original bees. Um, actually, you know what? I don't know off the top of my head. <laughs> we, will, we will get that answer. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I, more but, homework but, for Holly. That's right, more homework for me. But it is an interesting thing because it really does determine who's going to be the queen and all bees get a little bit of it when they're first born, but then to the, only the queen will be the one who will actually continue to feed onto it. So everybody gets a little taste in the beginning, but only the queen. The queen gets a, yeah. a lot. Um, when bees lay their eggs, how long does it take for them to hatch? Oh, so this is neat. It actually depends on the bee. Um, it can take a few days. So uh, most people know that the, um, the for honeybees, I won't say most people, but it, it's commonly known sometimes that um, with honeybees, the worker bee takes about 21 days from egg to hatch. Queens or not from hatch, from um, being an egg to an adult. Now, yeah. right, because as an adult, they will live for another potentially four to six weeks, depending on the species of bee. Um, with queens, it's actually only from, uh, it's only up to 16 days. And I believe with males, it's longer. So it really kind of depends on the individual, but it's only a matter of a few days. And so it just depends on the individual. And how long does the average bee travel? Oh, how far, I'm sorry. Again, this is dependent on the bee because some bees are very good at staying home. Um, honeybees in particular can travel very long distances because they need to be able to go out and scour a lot of different resources. Obviously, if it's only within a few miles close to them, it's really easy, good food sources. That's what you want to provide for them. But if bees need to, they can go quite a few miles to go out there and try and find the food sources they need. Well, 
we are out of time now. Uh, I want to thank you both for being here today and answering all of our questions. Uh, and I hope that uh, we have inspired those of you who are watching to look into the different jobs that you can do in either the aerospace industry uh, or here at SI Gardens. Um, you guys had some great questions. Uh, we're going to look a couple of them up and we'll try and get all the answers. And also, if you enjoyed this show, please be sure to check out our next one that will come out next month and it will be on spy planes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Thank you.